Hello, my name is Terry Stewart. This presentation is on analog function approximation. In particular, it's sort of the background information that went into designing Braindrop, which is a programmable analog chip for doing uh, using analog neural networks in order to um, compute and do, do programming with analog functions. So this is meant to be sort of the background thought that went into it. There will be a second part that talks about more details about Braindrop itself that sort of came out of these ideas. So analog neuromorphic computing, what is it? How can we do it? Um, and then how does that lead us to this idea of function approximation as a way of programming with neurons and as sort of a general framework for us to get these uh, chips to do useful things and to be able to treat them kind of like programming, kind of like how we would program digital chips. All right, analog neuromorphic computing. Why are we interested in this stuff at all? Okay, so neural networks are a big thing. Um, they use a lot of power. Um, so the human brain takes about 20 watts. Um, if I wanted to make a neural network um, about the size of the human brain, um, and have it running on GPUs. Um, right now, I would estimate that sort of thing to give you something like one and a bit gigawatts of power in order to run that. So um, that is a lot more power. So this, you know, this is what the human brain requires. This is what um, happens right now if we try to run that on GPUs. Um, something is wrong here. There's a big scale difference between these numbers. And it's also worth pointing out that, you know, we're used to computers getting better, computers getting faster over time, so maybe this is just a problem where I just, I just need to wait a few years and eventually this number will start looking like a human brain. Um, one interesting thing that sort of indicates maybe that's not going to be the case, at least with existing types of computing chips, um, this plot over here is uh, the amount, of, the number of transistors, the amount of computing power that you're going to get per dollar over time, and that used to be, okay, for the same amount of dollars, I would get more and more and more and more computing time. Somewhere around 2010, 2012, this seems to flatten off. Yeah. Um, so this is sort of the worry about, okay, well, maybe maybe it's not going to be the case that just things are going to keep getting better. Um, this means large neural networks are currently pretty prohibitively expensive to try to run. Um, so I would not be able to run neural networks the size of the human brain with any sort of reason. You know, I'd need a couple of nuclear power plants just dedicated to that um, system, um, you know, regardless of the cost of actually buying those GPUs. Um, but it's also the case that even these smaller neural networks that I could run on GPUs, well, it just takes so much power to run them that you can't deploy them in the situations you'd want to. So for instance, if you're putting image recognition in cars or voice recognitions on phones, you're dependent on how much power you have available to you um, and so you can't put as big a network as you were hoping. Um, you, you know, we could improve voice recognition that's on phones, um, but then that would just drain our battery really, really quickly. Um, so we need to have something else. You know, or with current technology, we've got this limit about how good a network, you know, if we make a really, really good voice recognition system, we just can't cram it onto the phone. Okay. So people have been working on making dedicated hardware to fix this. Um, and specifically focusing on neural networks. There's a variety of them out there, Spinnaker, Luigi, Spinnaker 2. Um, and I would ask that these things are going to improve, you know, if you want to build a model that big, um, you know, that'll bring, start bringing the power consumption down. Um, all these numbers that I'm showing here are my own estimates based on uh, working with these uh, chips. So, um, so, but that'll, you know, that gets us to some degree, to some of this path, but all of these are digital. And there's a hope that if we go down to analog, um, we can make an even bigger jump. Um, and the particular chip that we're going to be talking about in the next uh, of these videos is Braindrop. And our estimates would be if this would be get, start getting us down to, you know, still not as good as the human brain, um, but starting to get closer to the right ballpark. So that's that's why we're interested in this space. So these chips that I'm showing you about, you know, getting you know, improving, you know, dropping the power requirements for neural networks. Um, what's going on there? So a lot of them, so these, um, so we're going to start by looking at the improvements that these sorts of devices do. Um, a lot of them start doing things like, okay, well, let's just get rid of the unneeded aspects. If we're running this, this system in order to 
you know, compute neural networks. Let's just pare everything down and just have the um, things that are needed to do neural networks. And with most neural networks, you don't need huge precision numbers. You know, you can get away with smaller, with, you know, 0.3 is fine. Um, that turns out to be a huge power savings. Um, you don't need things like if statements and global variables and all the other sorts of things you would normally get um, in a traditional computer, even CPUs and GPUs. Um, all you really need is something to do nonlinearities and something to do matrix multiplies. That's what a neural network often is. Um, a few other things as well, but those are the core things. Um, so this is sort of approach that even things like Mobidius and Jetson and chips like that that are available are taking is let's just simplify, simplify what's on the hardware. Some of these other chips, the Spinnaker, Luigi ones that I was just looking at, pointing out in the uh, previous class, graph, go even farther and say, start thing, doing things like, well, hold on a second. Um, let's introduce spiking. You know, the neurons in the real brain um, uh, just sort of emit spikes. Can we can we do that in, in the hardware? Would that, would that help? And it turns out that to a certain degree, yes, it does. Um, so the idea there is instead of a neuron that's sort of outputting 0.28, you just have it output like output a 1 28% of the time and a 0 the other 72% of the time. Why would you want to do that? Well, that means that this multiplication, this this thing that a neural network does of taking the outputs of neurons and multiplying by a connection weight matrix, if I know that the outputs of my neurons are just zeros and ones, well, now multiplication just turns into addition. And that's much cheaper to implement in hardware. Um, now, um, that sort of approximation, there's a bunch of places where that doesn't really work all that great, but it does work if your inputs are sort of smoothly changing inputs. Um, so one way to think about that sort of, of you know, approximating an actual um, the number 0.28 with the number with ones and zeros, that's going to work well if your input is smoothly changing over time. It's not going to work well if your input of your network is like, okay, here's a picture, here's another picture, here's another picture, here's another picture. Um, but if the input to your neural network is a video, things tend to move smoothly over time if, if it's a video. It doesn't if it's like, okay, here's a picture of a cat, here's a picture of a dog, here's a picture of a house. Um, if you're just sort of feeding in images in sort of a random order, this is not going to work well. But if you do have video, if you have, if you have things that are smoothly changing over time, this can be a good approximation. There's lots of other things that can, people can talk about about why spiking the neurons are useful. Um, but this is at least one reason why they can be very efficient. Okay. Um, that's sort of where things like Spinnaker and uh, Luigi can get power um, savings from. But let's go that step farther. Uh, step farther is analog computation. Um, we're used to thinking about computers as turning everything into ones and zeros. Well, ones and zeros don't actually exist. Um, ones and zeros are actually just sort of voltage levels in, inside a computer chip. Um, you know, and, and there's a lot of hardware that is sort of desperately trying to keep, you know, w when the neuro uh, chip is representing a one, you know, it's some voltage level and you want to keep that voltage level right near the correct voltage level. Um, and when it transitions to a zero, you've got to move that volt, that power level from a one down to a zero. Um, that's where a lot of the power consumption in these chips are. So, okay, I've only, I've only got two voltage levels that I want to do. I want to keep those things at those voltage levels. And whenever I change something, I've got to change that voltage level. Um, let's not do that. Um, let's just, you know, if, if I'm trying to emulate neurons, let's actually use physics to do this computation. Let's use resistors and capacitors and let's just make this all happen. Okay. Or transistors and capacitors, I guess. Um, of course we can't perfectly, con you know, there's going to be some trade-offs here. Um, and there's a variety of, of different issues that are coming up there. Um, one interesting complication with analog devices, especially as they're made smaller and smaller, is that you, that every single chip is different. That when you, when you manufacture the chip, the, um, the actual, um, value, the actual, um, you know, if I say I want a capacitor of this strength at this point in the chip, I'm going to get something that's slightly different. And I'm going to need some sort of way of modifying that. There's a variety of different methods out there. Um, in particular, one prominent method that I'm not going to talk about here is the um, uh, is using floating gates. That's the sort of stuff. Uh, so Jennifer Hassler's work with um, uh, those sort of 
floating gates as sort of a, a really nice example of how to um, deal with this sort of mismatch issue and in a very um, rigorous way. That's not the approach we're going to kind of here. What we're going to do here is we're going to say, well, fine, let's just manufacture these things and then deal with the fact that every chip is going to be different. And we're going to deal with that in a way that sort of combines analog um, and digital in interesting ways to make up for the fact that I can't perfectly replicate every chip. Okay, so what are we going to, what do we mean? What are we going to do with this? So what is this function approximation thing that I'm talking about? And this sort of gets to, well, what do we want these chips to do? Um, I wanted them to be able to do sort of neural networky type things, but what are neural networky type things? So one way to think about what a neural network does is function approximation. So with this sort of diagram here, you can imagine a neural network of, I feed in some inputs, it has some connection weights, it has some neurons, it has some connection weights, it has some outputs. Okay, And as I vary my input, that's going to mean that I vary my output. And so that means I can think of this whole thing um, as approximating some function, that y is some function of x. And I can change that function by changing these weights. So as I change these weights, um, I change you know, what exactly the relationship is between my input and my output. And that's just sort of a general way of thinking about neural networks. Um, and this is actually, this is a pretty old way of thinking about neural networks. Indeed, um, you know, this, if you go all the way back to perceptrons, so this is Rosenblatt, 1956, it's a diagram from, from there, where it's pretty much the same structure. You have some sort of input that is going to some first layer of things. You have some sort of connections to some intermediate hidden, uh, middle layer. Um, and then you have your actual output. Um, and what they did in this sort of setup is randomly do these weights, okay, random connections here. Um, and then they had some sort of learning system, the standard perceptron learning rule, that would adjust these weights in order to get the output to be what you want. Okay, so that was like, this, this is the original plan behind neural networks. Um, the, um, here's an actual picture of the actual you know, hardware from 1960 when they went and actually built a physical one of these. Um, again, random connections, some sort of learning, learning rule here, the particular learning rule um, that was sort of emphasized back then as the, the delta rule. Um, basically what you're doing is, hey, if the output is larger than I want it to be, so the T is the target, my target output, minus uh, the actual output Y, um, if the output is too large, then I want to decrease the weights. If the output is too small, then I want to increase the weights. Which weights should I increase and decrease? Well, increase and decrease the ones that are associated with, neuron, with neurons here that are very active. So that's take the error, the difference between what, you're, um, what, you have, uh, what you want and what you have, multiply it by the activity of the hidden layer. That's how much I change my weight. Back then, actually, in this particular hardware, they even had sort of, you know, this is, you know, they actually, actually had physical um, devices that they were, uh, that were adjusting the, the, the connection strength on these things. And they actually have little motors that would move them back and forth to implement this learning rule. Um, so that's, that was the core idea, and that could, you know, we should be able to go ahead and approximate lots of different things there. Right. So this idea is around for a very long time. Um, of course, there are other methods of getting those weights. Um, indeed, if you really want to think about these um, uh, these weights here um, as some sort of target value, so in this initial work, they were often thinking about these output weights as, or these output values as either being one or zero. If we instead have that output be a continuous value, this actually turns into the regression problem. This turns into O. Oh, I have some desired value. I have some things, some measurements. I want to know what I can multiply my measurements by and then take each of these measurements, multiply each one by some weight, do a weighted sum, um, and I will get some value out. This is regression. Okay? There are tools for doing this. You can do least squares minimization and you can just go ahead and compute what weights um, will give you the best value. Okay? Um, this, is, this is regression. Uh, if, um, if people have done it before, or least squares minimization, has lots of different names. Um, but that's an alternate way of finding these weights, 
um, if you know what the activity of your middle layer of neurons is, um, and if you know what your what your target values are. However, all of that that I just talked about is just about optimizing this set of weights here. Okay? Everything that I've said before, um, or everything that I've, that I've said here is all about optimizing this set of weights. It says nothing about how to optimize this set of weights. Okay? This was the thing that killed neural networks for a long time. So people knew all of this stuff in 50s and 60s. Um, the big challenge then of neural networks was, well, hold on a second. Yeah, I know what to do with this set of weights. What the heck do I do with this set of weights? Um, and there was lots of interesting proofs that said, hey, for interest, for lots of interesting functions, um, yeah, I could get a weight, you know, if I had an infinite number of these weights here, then, or if I had an exponentially large number of these things here, then yeah, this, this thing would work. Um, but the challenge was for s some classes of functions, it was hard, you, know, you needed a lot of weights here. But not for all classes of functions. For a lot of functions, this sort of method that I'm showing here is perfectly fine. All right. um, the way that people um, nowadays solve this sort of problem is you have many, many, many layers of this, um, and you do back propagation. You do the back propagation learning algorithm, which is exactly the same as what I just described for this set of weights, but then gives you a way of updating these weights as well. Okay. Uh, but you can still get a lot, do a lot with just this process. Um, I do want to extend this a little bit um, in that in all of the graphs that I've shown so far, I've sort of written them as y is some function of x. And this is sort of implying that the output is only a function of my, of my input right now. Okay. There's lots of situations where I might want my output to be a function of the past history of my input or some sort of recent, so, um, you know, if, if I'm recognizing a word, the sound coming into my ears right now, I mean, is not enough information. I also need the sound coming into my ears over the last you know, 100 milliseconds or 50 milliseconds or however long the word is. I need all of that information in order to recognize the word. Um, so I'm going to want some sort of, um, uh, of being able to um, have my output be some function of, of the um, previous values as well. It turns out this structure is also fine for that if your neurons are doing something interesting. So for example, and, and it's exactly, and you can do exactly the same process to do this. So for example, if your neuron has any internal state in it, so if your neuron's behavior is not just uh, sensitive to uh, its input right now, but also its recent input, and it, almost every spiking neuron model has that sort of property. For most spiking neuron models, there's some sort of internal voltage. The input changes that internal voltage, and then when that internal voltage hits some threshold, then it emits a spike. And so that means it's only... It, whether or not it emits a spike right now is based on the you know recent input that's been changing that voltage. You can do exactly the same trick, same trick that I just described in order to um, uh, to do this function approximation thing. Okay, but I, I want to highlight here is that you can you don't just have to approximate. You you can try to approximate functions that are better more than just okay my output is the same as is a function of my input right now. What's an example of that? So here's an example of some randomly generated signal that I'm feeding into a group of neurons. So this is exactly the same diagram here. I've got only one input. I've got some random set of weights here. I've got a, some leaky integrate and fire neurons. Okay, so I'm just thinking about this part of the system right now. Okay, I can take this randomly generated input. I can feed it into my neurons and each row here is, an, is a separate neuron and I'm just, okay, they're just, I'm putting a little tick mark there whenever they spike. So that's my data. But now I can do if regression on this data. So I can say, okay, well, what weighted sum of this activity um, could I use to approximate some function? Okay. Exactly the same thing I would do, um, um, or exactly the same process I was just describing. Um, but I could do some complicated function. I could do a function like, okay, what if I want my output to be whatever my input was 10 milliseconds ago. Okay, I could try that as a function. And it turns out that's doable. Okay, so this down here, I do that regression. I find a set of connection weights that gives me this set of weights. Okay, and now I go ahead and run the model. All right, and now, okay, again, this, this input, that's the same input that I was showing up there. I get some, some spiking activity. 
um, and I do my output, and the output is some function of uh, the recent history. So what I'll, my, my point there is if your neuron models are interesting, if your neuron model has um, some sort of internal state information, that opens the door to approximating a wider class of functions. You don't just have to think of a neural network as having um, its output being dependent just on its input. But we can still use this standard, this same trick. Um, some fun puzzles in there because you have to do things like making sure that when you're generating this initial data to do the regression on, um, you you have to make sure that you've done a good job of exploring big parts of the space so that we're you know, so that such that it'll generalize well. Um, but that is completely doable. Okay. So we can take the individual details of exactly when neurons are spiking and have this sort of exact spike timing code. Um, uh, if we're taking this approach of you know use one layer of neurons um, and do this sort of approach of I have some connection weights. Um, and I'm going to solve for my output connection weights. Um, we can also um, take synapses into account. What do I mean by that? It, in biology, um, when neurons connect to other neurons, um, a spike is transmitted, but then oftentimes what that spike is doing is it's changing the amount of current that's going to flow into a neuron over time. So a spike, when it arrives at a neuron, doesn't just affect what the neuron gets right now. It also affects its input over the near future. Um, and what you tend to get is something like, oh, when a spike happens, it causes current to come into the next neuron initially pretty quickly, and then it dec decays out. Okay, something like that sort of shape. Um, or even this one up here, where you say, okay, well, immediately when the spike happens, I get lots of current flowing in, and then less and less and less and less current. Um, we can also, if, you know, so that sort of thing exists. It also might be something that people are putting in their neuromorphic chips, okay? Because um, again, even especially um, on an analog chip, um, you can't perfectly inject just one pulse of current at one particular point in time. You're going to be doing something over time. Okay? If you have a good model for this, then you've got a couple different, or you've got a couple options of how to deal with that. One thing to deal, deal with this is, hey, when I'm gathering the spike data. Um, also apply that synapse model to it um, and then do the regression. Okay. So that's one thing I can do is just make sure I gather that data with it. Um, or I can even, if these things are linear, reasonably linear, um, I can actually add it after the fact. Okay. Now, one thing this also does is really change the sorts of class of functions you can approximate. Okay. Um, there's a couple of good examples for, how, uh, for what that does. So similarly to how adding it, you know, having a neuron that has state information lets me, gives me access to a wider class of functions. Um, similarly, adding in a synapse that also has some um, dynamics over time is also going to change the class of functions I can do. Um, there's an interesting exploration from Tapson et al. Um, uh, that's looking across these sorts of different synapse models. Um, so that's one um, interesting approach. Um, and another uh, another fascinating work, so there's some work um, um, out of the Waterloo lab um, uh, from Andreas Stockel, um, where putting in sort of more complex synapses and things like conductances and nonlinearities in the dendrite also change the class of functions um, uh, that you can approximate um, uh, with just one layer. Okay. Um, cool. So yeah, so adding in these neural details can change the class of functions um, that you're good at approximating, um, or at least um, how how well you could approximate these functions with a certain number of neurons. All right. Where else are we going to go with this? Um, and in particular, can we figure out what classes of functions neurons are going to be good at? Because if I'm saying this sort of, well, different neurons types, different neuron details are going to change what classes of functions I can do. If I want this to be an analog chip that I can sort of say, hey, here, here's a thing that'll let you do computations quickly. I need to also be able to tell people well, what computations is this going to help me with. Okay. The variety of different ways of doing that. Um, in particular, since what functions we're going to be good at approximating is dependent on what your neuron type is, um, it might be useful to sort of get a sense of, you know, across a variety of neuron types, what sorts of things tend to prop out. Um, one way to do that, um, especially if you have a neuron type that isn't 
doesn't have that much sensitivity to time. Um, well, okay, I'm going to start with, I'm going to assume I have a neuron model that doesn't have much temporal dynamics. This same trick is also going to apply for neurons that have lots of temporal dynamics. Um, what, we're, what we can do is you can feed in different inputs to your neurons, um, hold the inputs constant for a while. So this is across here, I'm varying the actual input. And then each of these lines is a different neuron. Um, I'm just going to hold the input constant for a while, count how many spikes I get out um, in a certain unit of time, and I can get these curves. So this is sort of the, here's the behavior of my model ignoring time. If I want to do this not ignoring time, then I would keep do this same sort of graph, except it would extend into the page, and it would be, um, uh, so it would be a three-dimensional plot um, where it would still have time. Um, in this particular plot, I'm collapsing time out. Um, but then what I can do, whether or not I have this plot or I have the full plot, um, I can take that and I can do singular value decomposition on it. Why would I do that? Well, if what I'm going to do with this network is take these outputs of these neurons and do weighted sums of them, if I wanted to characterize, well, what's the class of things that I could be good at approximating if I'm doing weighted sums of these curves, that is what singular value decomposition is, gives you, right? or principal components analysis, whatever you want to call that. Um, what that's going to do is it's going to tell me what are the things that weighted sums of these curves would be good at approximating. Okay, so you do that calculation, you get some eigenvectors and some eigenvalues, and then you say, okay, these are my top five eigenvalues. Um, what do they look like? For a, for leak integrate and fire neurons, rectified linear neurons, a bunch, a few other, um, a lot of the, the sort of standard simple neuron models, you'd get this sort of plot. And what's this saying? This is saying that the function that these neurons are best at is this blue line. Okay, so this is a function where, regardless of my input, my output is the same value. All right, so that's sort of like, you know, a function where, regardless of my input, my output is one. Okay, all right, that's a useless, that's not a particularly useful function, but fine, we can do that. Um, the second most easiest function for it to approximate is this green line. Okay, what's that? That's a function that, you know, if my input is x, my output is x, or my input is x, my output is 2x, or my input is x, my output is 0.1x. Those sorts of functions are the second best thing that these sorts of neurons are good at. Okay? The third best thing is this function here, this red line. Okay, what's that? Well, that's x squared. And then there's x cubed, and then there's x to the fourth. Technically, these are not just x. Technically, these are Legendre polynomials, not the um, not the standard polynomials. But since they're, um, you can be good at these functions, and you're going to be good at linear combinations of these functions, we can just think of it as polynomials. So another way of thinking of that is that if this is your set of neurons, then the easiest functions to approximate are these and these, these and these, and any linear combinations of these. So if I wanted to approximate x cubed plus x plus 1, um, the overall error is going to be sort of dominated by how much error I'm making on this x cubed thing. Right? So it's going to be pretty easy for it to do the x in the 1 part. The x cubed part is going to be the part that's going to have the most difficulty, and I would need more neurons for that. Again, as I increase my number of neurons, I can approximate anything to any degree that I want, but we're going to hit the same practical problem that people you know, with uh, perceptrons were hitting that, hey, you can't have an infinite number of things here. You're going to have some reasonably small finite number, um, so now we can know what we're going to be good at. Another way of thinking about this is that neurons are going to be good at approximating smooth functions. Okay. If the function varies a lot wildly, I'm going to need more neurons to do it. Okay. All right. Um, that's getting so. So, but what happens if I want to do some function that has um, that is pretty non-smooth? How do I want to build things up, or how, how how can I how can I deal with that? Well, the trick that sort of deep neural network people have said is, hey, you will probably want to have many layers. Can we do the same thing here? Well, what would the same thing look like? Well, I would say that instead of you know why is some function of x. We could break functions into two parts. I could do something that approximates, does some computation, and then does another computation. 
that's if I can take some complicated function that I want to build and break it down into parts and those individual parts are smooth okay, this is a very different way of building up a large neural network rather than doing something like oh I'll just put a bunch of layers here and then let backprop solve across this whole thing this starts being something closer to programming this being starts being something closer to engineering where I'm you know I have particular knowledge about the sorts of things that I want to build and so I can break that thing down into smaller parts. I can build neural networks that do these separate parts, and then I can go ahead um, uh, and combine them together and have the overall system work. Okay. Um, there's some interesting connections between this and normal neural networks. So for instance, you know, if I sort of build this thing that I'm describing here, I do my regression to solve for these weights. Um, and if these weights are still sort of randomly chosen or chosen through some sort of backprop process that was done across these, if I really wanted to just have be closer to sort of like a traditional neural network, a traditional neural network, or indeed the brain itself, would do something like, oh, I've got neurons here, I've got neurons here. I'm supposed to have connections from these neurons to these neurons. I don't generally have some intermediate stage. Okay. Well, the nice thing is, if this intermediate stage isn't doing anything, well, I can just multiply these together. Right? These, these are mathematically identical. Okay. So, and this would be something closer to what people would often expect with a deep neural network. Okay. But we've generated this set of weights in a very different way. Instead of, instead of doing something like generating these weights by doing backprop across this whole system, I've taken a look at the function, the thing that I want to do, I've broken it into parts, I've done a simpler learning thing. I've just done regression here, or I could have done backprop across these two. Um, but most of the time I can just get away with just doing a regression here. Um, I do regression here. That gets my two parts, combine them together. Um, I can get, you know, I can turn, I can generate these weights if I want to, um, but they're also mathematically identical to doing it this way. So this is what I mean by programming with neurons. This is the sort of thing that I want to be able to do with these neuromorphic chips. I want to be able to, I don't want to have, you know, custom do, you know, design exactly um, what every single neuron is doing on one of these chips. Instead, I want to be able to sort of define something like this, where I'm like, okay, these are the computations that I want to do at each of these stages. Okay. And then I want to be able to just have the whole system go ahead um, and uh, turn all of that into a neural network. Okay. I want to push this slightly farther, though, because there's one thing that I've sort of, if, I, if I'm drawing all these components out, there's one thing I've skipped, and that is often, at least in biology and often in these neuromorphic hardware, there is that synapse thing that I mentioned before, and that synapse is going to change what's being computed along here. If I ask a network to approximate some function, but then I put a synapse involved, now things are going to sort of change smoothly in time because of that synapse. All right. Uh, Math-wise, what that's saying is, hey, if I've asked this system to approximate some function, but then I also say at the, at the neuron level there is some sort of um, postsynaptic current, some sort of synapse involved there. Um, if that synapse is linear, um, which a lot of synapse models are, um, then what I can do is I can say, well, okay, even though that synapse is actually being applied at each of these neurons, I could also just sort of pretend it's being applied here. So it means, what, what do I mean by that? I mean that if I've asked my system to approximate some function f of x, what I'm actually going to get out is that function f of x convolved with this shape. For those that are used to this sort of terminology, this is going to be, you know, in this, in this sort of shape, this is something like apply a low-pass filter to my data, smooth my data over time a little bit, get rid of any high-frequency changes to it. So what? All right, so fine, i got to take that into account when I'm doing these big models. Well, it turns out there's one extra thing I get out of that. In particular, if I start allowing groups of neurons to connect back to themselves, and if I do it in this sort of structure, if I do it in this sort of structure of, well, when I make these recurrent connections, I'm also approximating some function on that recurrent connection. Um, 
if I do that, then now all of a sudden how y is going to change is going to be not only input, but it's also going to depend on this function. And uh, now this math is starting to get look ugly. For those that are familiar with that sort of math, if you have this sort of thing and you say, hey, well, what's the overall system going to do? You do a Laplace transform, you do some reorganizing. It's going to depend on exactly what that synapse model is, but this sort of trick, standard trick is going to work for any linear synapse model. What this is going to end up saying is that my overall y is going to vary like this. Okay, so the actual behavior of my system is going to vary based as a function of whatever this, um, whatever function I've asked the recurrent connection to approximate is, and whatever function my input is approximating, and the time constant of my synapse. Okay, that's weird. So what? What does that mean? Um, it means if I want a particular differential equation then I can build my networks to approximate these functions and I'll get this differential equation. Why is that important? Well, that means that when I'm doing this high-level design stuff, I don't have to be limited to just normal functions. I can also say, hey, I would like this differential equation at this point. Okay, so this is the sort of programming that I think is the right sort of programming or a right sort of programmer. Here's at least a framework for programming a neuromorphic chip at the large scale, okay? Where I'm going to be programming individual parts, combine them together, get an overall system that does something that I want. Okay. And I can specify things at this level, the sort of abstract level of variables and functions, but then through the process I just described, we can then turn that into groups of neurons, recurrent groups of neurons, intermediate values, and then if I want to get rid of these intermediate values, I can get rid of the intermediate values by multiplying those weight matrices together. And now here I have something that is just neurons on the middle, but the input and the output is what I've designed it to be. Okay. This is what we call neural engineering. And the, overall, this is the neural engineering framework. Okay. That's the mindset that I'm going to go into designing an analog computing chip to fit that sort of mindset. Okay. Um, I will say this mindset has been, you know, previously it's been it's been used very successfully to build large scale models of, of biological cognition. So this whole idea originally started from just an attempt at modeling biological neurons. That's where that whole framework came from. If I want to build models of the brain, I want to understand how the whole brain is working. I want to be able to understand individual parts, design individual parts, combine them together, and have a model of, of the brain. Um, so it was used for things like uh, Spawn, which was um, a large-scale uh, functional uh, brain model. Um, and that was all designed from this idea of, okay, I'm going to feed input into groups of neurons. The output of these groups of neurons is sort of weighted sums of activities. Um, and we can send outputs back to other groups. So this is really all I need out of my hardware. So these are the things that I, in order to do this, I need hardware that will let me feed input into groups of neurons, take output from groups of neurons that is weighted sums of the activities, and I want to be able to take that output and send it to other groups or back to itself. Okay. So that's, that's sort of the core thing that I need out of my hardware. As for those weights, I don't have to precisely control the input weights. So in everything that I was saying, showing so far, um, oops, let's go all the way back. This set of weights, I hadn't really been picky about. If I can control this set of weights, then I can probably approximate functions to a, to a better degree than if I could. So yes, if I'm able to do something like backprop to adjust these weights, then I can probably approximate functions a little bit better. Um, but for a large, pretty large class of functions, I can get away with having some sort of random distribution of these weights. How random? How do we pick that? What's that distribution going to look like? Clearly, we want some sort of control over this distribution, but we maybe don't need precise control. Okay. I do if I'm going to do this regression trick, though, or or do with the uh, or do the delta rule learning approach. Um, I'm going to need to be able to control these weights to make this happen. Um, I will note that in hardware, I tend not to do this trick. I tend to leave it as this, um, because even though these two things are identical, this involves a lot more memory. So this weight matrix tends to be much larger 
than having these two weight matrices separate. Okay, and the larger weight matrix is going to be more in memory, going to be harder for me to, um, uh, yeah, more storage. So I'm going to tend to stick with this um, sort of regime. Um, right. So that's something that I want out of these weights. As for the neurons and synapses, everything I've said before, said so far, you know, I don't really care what neuron model it is. Okay. Um, the yeah, like it, it should be something. It needs to be something that's nonlinear. Fine, um, but um, but I don't really care exactly what it's going to do. Um, having some sort of internal state would be useful. Um, and if we're going to go manufacture this chip, it would be really good to sort of like, okay, well, here's a particular neuron model that say I might be really easy and efficient for me to implement. We might want to do some simulations in order to find out, okay, would those neurons um, work for the sorts of, you know, what would happen if we did, um, oops, where's the, S, the singular value? You know, what happened if we do this sort of analysis on whatever that other neuron is? Would Do we get similar results? Would that be good or bad? Um, so we might want to check that. Um, but pre, a pretty wide variety of things could be good. Um, having some internal state in the neuron is going to give, give us access to um, a wider class of functions we could compute. Although I will also comment that um, if, as long as you can do that recurrent connection thing, um, getting access to uh, differential equations also gives us a pretty wide variety of things that we can compute. Um, and so um, this is sort of all right, I can access a pretty wide variety of functions if I can put in this recurrent connection, but that re but that is going to require more resources because I've got to implement this recurrent connection. Um, if I have a neuron with internal state, there will be some classes of differential equations um, that I'm able to do without this recurrent connection. Um, yeah, uh, synapses can let us compute that if the synapse itself can be characterized. So that's the mindset that we're going to go into to try to design brain drops, the sort of things that we were thinking of um, in order to come up with this chip. Um, and in my next video, I will talk about what details were and how we actually um, just made what decisions we made on all of these issues. Thank you, and I'll see you in the next talk.